Here we are again, uh, our small group uh, series entitled, How to Love Someone You Hate. And this is uh, lesson number three in that uh, series. And the title of this uh, lesson is Blessing, Not Cursing. Okay, so in our previous lesson, we learned the key idea and scripture upon which uh, this lesson is based. And that is Romans uh, chapter 12, verse uh, 21. And the, uh, the idea upon which uh, this is based, and that is that aggressive good overcomes the evil that we cannot stand in other people. Uh, in other words, uh, we should pinpoint the evil in the person and not the person itself. And our emotion should be uh, you know, uh, aimed at the evil in the person and not the, the individual themselves. The idea of doing good to people that we can't stand seems, you know, it seems impossible at times. And that's why we need to, you know, we need to baby steps. We need to do it in small steps. So when Jesus said that we should love our enemies, you know, it isn't that we go from hating our enemies to loving them in one step, small steps. And this short course here, a small group discussion course, uh, lays out some of those steps that we can take to go from, you know, I can't stand that person to I actually love that person with the love of uh, the love of Christ. So today we're going to look at uh, this process uh, a step at a time. Now, uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could uh, simply pray and ask God to uh, just make the conflict, whatever it is, to make the conflict to go away in our lives. And then boom, everything is gone. And we make a prayer, please God, you know, I want everything to be okay between me and my brother or me and my husband or you know, my friend or the person at work. And uh, God would answer that prayer uh, in a moment and everything would be fine. But we know from experience that life just doesn't work that way. It doesn't happen that way because the blood of Christ takes away the wall between ourselves and God, right? The sins that we have and the wall that, that those sins have created between ourselves and God, but the, the blood of Christ does not take away the wall that may have been built between ourselves and the people we can't stand or the people that we, that we hate. For those to be renewed, uh, you know, that relationship to be renewed for that wall that's between us and, and those difficult people in our lives. Um, uh, we need the help of Christ and it's in stages. So Paul uh, helps us understand the process of removing this hatred, this dislike from our hearts with his instructions, uh, specifically in Romans chapter 12, verse 14, where he says the following, he says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Very good first step. Bless and do not curse. Christians will be persecuted for a variety of reasons. I mean, it's, it's a promise, isn't it? In, in, in the Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Uh, we will be persecuted for our beliefs, for example. Uh, you know, it's not a popular thing to say that Jesus Christ is the only savior. He's the only mediator between uh, man and, and God. Uh, people don't like the exclusivity of the Christian religion. And many times when you promote this idea, when you, you, know, you actually preach it or share your faith in that way, it doesn't always get a, a positive uh, reaction. Many times you're persecuted in a variety of ways for your beliefs. Uh, and sometimes uh, Christians are persecuted for their moral uh, position. The, uh, you know, the positions we take on various uh, moral issues. We, we, we believe, for example, that uh, sex outside of marriage uh, is uh, sinful. We, uh, we believe that uh, gay marriage is not permissible uh, by God. And, and, and a whole variety of other uh, moral positions that we take as uh, Christians. Our position on uh, abortion, for example, not very popular in, in, in much of uh, society. And for that reason, we may be uh, persecuted for those things. Sometimes we're persecuted because our conscience will not permit us to simply hate somebody we dislike and just leave it at that. 
You know, our flesh says, wouldn't it be nice? Leave me alone. You know, our spirit and flesh, they're always fighting with each other. You know, there's always a, a tension between the spirit and the flesh. And the flesh wants to just hate that, but would you just leave me alone? Let me just hate on that person. You know, let me just enjoy hating that person or disliking that person or giving that person a silent treatment or whatever, you know? But our spiritual side is always pulling us back, is always reminding us that our Lord is uh, telling us that we should love our enemies, not, not hate our enemies. So there's always that, that tension. The spirit within us demands that we fight this weakness uh, in our flesh. So we can't go through life without being wronged somehow or another because of our faith, whether it's by our family or friends. Uh, sometimes someone in the church uh, uh, does something that uh, hurts our, our feelings. And, and when all these things happen, we, we need to overcome evil with good. That's what Paul is saying. We need to overcome evil with good. Remember we were talking about that last time, you know, aggressive good. Uh, overcomes uh, evil. And Paul says we need to begin that aggressive good with our mouth. That's where to start, he says. Don't curse, he says. Bless instead when you are, when you are wronged. So let's examine these two key words so we can kind of understand what we're to avoid and what we are to do. So cursing, he begins with cursing. You know, he says, don't curse, you know, cursing. Well, originally uh, the term meant to, to doom or to desire or call down punishment or destruction on another person. Uh, in general, we curse in a variety of ways. For example, uh, we use a vulgar language. Uh, usually, you know, in, in, in popular usage, if someone says, oh, he cursed, usually it's the use of you know, uh, uh, vulgar language uh, and usually, uh, usually using vulgar language in terms of another person, okay? Uh, or in relationships, we say bad things to God about someone. That's another way of cursing. Uh, David, the psalmist, for example, uh, did this in uh, what are called uh, the imprecatory Psalms. Uh, uh, Psalm 55, verse 15, for example, David, uh, is saying to God, let death come deceitfully upon them, you know, his enemies, right? Let, let death just sneak up on my enemies. Let them go down alive to Sheol. Never mind dying and going to the underworld. Let them go down to the underworld while they're still alive, almost like being swallowed up by an earthquake, you know? Uh, for evil is in their dwelling, uh, in, their, in their midst. So that's another way of cursing, right? Uh, speaking badly to God about someone else or asking God to harm someone else. That's, that's a curse. Um, another way is to talk badly about someone to other people. That's a form of cursing. Uh, and probably the most prevalent type of cursing we do uh, towards other people in this uh, day and age. You know, when we have nothing good to say or we continually bring up our personal slight against a person to others, you know, whenever we talk about uh, someone else or that person's name comes into a conversation that we're having with someone else, we say, oh yeah, uh, Joe, whoever it is, you know, oh yeah, well, did I ever tell you what he did to me? You know, that, that, that slight, that hurt, that weakness, that failing, that, that somehow affected us uh, negatively. We, we make sure to mention it. We make sure to describe it to other people when we're having some sort of conversation uh, with them. And in doing so, in effect, we're cursing that other person. Uh, we do that about people at work or even worse, we do that about our own brothers uh, in Christ uh, at church when we talk negatively about them or sometimes, you know, it's the leadership. Right? Uh, what do they say? You know, the, the, the best, the, um, the, the, the most common meal after church is we're having the preacher for lunch or we're having one of the elders for lunch. Doesn't mean we're inviting the preacher or the elder you know, to come and have lunch with us, but we're actually uh, perhaps deconstructing his sermon and criticizing what he said or did or how he did it or what the elder said. You know, and all these things are a form of, of cursing. And then we talk badly to, directly to the person themselves. Uh, threats or angry words or giving them the silent treatment, uh, you know, withholding our love, 
making them doubt, making them think that something is wrong, but not allowing them to fix or even attempt to uh, make right uh, what, uh, what is wrong. You know, all of this, all of these things, they're all one form or another of cursing that other person. So Paul says not to do that, not to curse, but he said, bless. And so the word blessing meant to speak well of or to think uh, or to invoke a prayer uh, on behalf of someone else. For example, uh, say good things about that person to God. You know, it's hard to stay angry and hate the person that you are actually praying for. I mean, try it. <laughs> that person that you hate, that person you can't stand, that person who's hurt you, whatever it is, you know, try praying for that person and you know, keeping up you know, your, your feelings of anger and hatred. Uh, prayer has a way of you know, dousing the flames, if you, if, if you will, when you pray for someone uh, that uh, you're having problems with. Uh, you, good examples of that in the Bible, um, Jesus asked God to forgive those who crucified him, right? In Luke chapter 23, verse 34, uh, it says that Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among uh, themselves. So while Jesus was being crucified, he was praying for the ones who were crucifying him. Well, if you read a little bit later on in, uh, in Acts chapter two, you, you learn that uh, Peter was preaching to a crowd uh, of many thousands of people uh, on uh, Pentecost Sunday. And it says that 3000 of those people uh, came forward and they, they believed in Jesus and they were, they were baptized. Well, have you ever thought that a lot of those people among the ones who were hearing the gospel and some who uh, received the message and were baptized, were among the people who were you know, approving of the crucifixion or who participated in it in some fashion. Uh, so the people that Jesus was praying for, that God forgave them, uh, several you know, days later uh, on the day of Pentecost, some of those people heard the message of the gospel and, and, and were baptized and received the forgiveness of their sins. And so Jesus' prayer for forgiveness was actually answered. Uh, another example, Stephen, one of the uh, first uh, uh, deacons, if you wish, Stephen asked God to forgive those who had persecuted and were in the process of stoning him. Uh, in Acts uh, chapter seven, uh, uh, we read about that. Uh, much, like, you know, much like Jesus, Stephen was asking God to forgive the people who were in the process of killing him. And we find, uh, you know, uh, Luke writes that one of the people who participated in that was a young man named Saul, uh, who was present and approved of the stoning of, of Stephen. And then we find out a few chapters later in the book of Acts that this very same Saul uh, was called by Christ and uh, uh, received the message of, of Jesus and believed and he also was baptized and his sins uh, were forgiven. We read about that in Acts chapter 22 verse 16 where Ananias, the person who preached the gospel to Saul said, Saul, Saul, you know, uh, why do you wait? You know, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. And we learn that Paul uh, did that very thing. So Stephen is praying for the people who were present and who were in the process of, of killing him. And one of those people later on um, received the gospel and became a great, a great apostle. So his prayer uh, was also answered. And one other example from the Old Testament in Job chapter 42, it says that after Job prayed for his friends, remember the three friends that, that came to, to see and supposedly comfort Job, uh, but instead criticized him and treated him badly? Uh, Job prayed for them. And uh, after he was restored to good health, uh, the Bible says that Job received twice as much as he had uh, uh, before, his, uh, before his suffering. So um, uh, uh, say good things about your enemy. Say good things about the one that you hate or that you can't stand to God. Pray for that person. You know, where do I start with this process of trying to love my, 
my enemy. Well, you start with prayer. You start by saying good things and wanting good things for them and appealing to God on their behalf. A second step is say good things about your enemy to, um, to other people. Uh, that's also very helpful. You know, the fastest way to cool the fires of division and hurt uh, between you and another person is to begin to say what you know is good about your enemy. You know, the, 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 the bad may still be there, but you choose to find and repeat only the good. I mean, that's within your, your purview, that's within your ability to choose and say only what you know that is good about that, uh, that individual. And, and, and one of the ways that we need to do that is by, you know, we need to stop using the word but uh, in our conversation about our enemies. Yeah, Joe, let's keep Joe as our example, shall we? Uh, yeah, Joe, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, no, he's a good guy and he's always, he's a pretty steady guy and this and that, but, and then we, you know, we put in how I'm hurt and what I don't like about him, so on and so forth. Boy, if we could just remove that word but in our conversation about our enemies, uh, we would go a long way in smoothing out the relationship. Uh, neutralize the acid of your own hatred when you're talking and saying only good things about your enemy. It takes away any reason for your enemy to hate you, or it also takes away any um, ammunition that your friends have to continue this uh, uh, hatred. You know, sometimes people, they love to fan the flames. You know, they see that there's a, a fire going and instead of trying to put out the fire, they fan the flames. So don't contribute, you know, to the fire. Uh, when discussing that individual, make sure you've, you, you either say nothing or you say only the things that you know are true uh, and that are good or positive about that uh, individual. And then say something good to the person you hate directly. You might not be able to settle or to solve the problem with them uh, uh, in person because it's not always in your power to do so. Uh, but you can choose to say what is good to them for their edification when you have the chance. Jesus said that uh, he would be judged or we rather would be judged by the things that came out of our mouths, right? What does he say? Matthew 12, 37, for by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. Even the things uh, that we say to those we can't stand, those things uh, will be part of uh, uh, what is uh, judged uh, about us. So uh, we may not have the solution. Um, uh, we may not get the apology that we perhaps deserve. Uh, we may not have the power to change the person that we can't stand or erase the hurt that they have caused. However, we have to concentrate on what we can do and what is within our power to do. And one of these is to avoid the negative, very simply. Uh, stop complaining to God. Stop bad-mouthing that person or that organization to other people. Stop acting in an unchristian way towards the one that we can stand. I mean, that's all within our power to do. We can do that. We don't need the other person to do that. We have the power to do that. And begin finding good things to say about this person to God, good things to say about this person to other people, and expressing good and positive things to them when we are uh, in their uh, company. Uh, and so this is the beginning point. You know, where, where do I start? You know, the answer to the question, where do I begin? Where do I start in this process of, of, of loving my enemy? It begins with the, with the mouth. And, and, and it begins by uh, stopping uh, negative comments, destructive comments, stopping, you know, uh, pleading the case, pleading your case, uh, and, and beginning to say things that are positive, uh, uh, at the very least neutral, 
uh, about the person we, uh, we can't stand, whether it is to God or to others or to that person themselves. Okay, so that's uh, this lesson here, bless, don't curse, but bless rather, step number one. All right, so I've got a couple of uh, discussion questions uh, for your small groups uh, for the discussion uh, part, and I'll give you those in a moment. Uh, until then, God bless you. We'll see you next time for the next lesson in our small group series. Bye-bye. Question number one. In what places have you most often been wronged or received persecutions? Let each person in the group discuss. Question number two. When you curse, which of the four ways does it usually manifest itself? Vulgarity, God, gossip, or the person? Open discussion. Question number three. Why does blessing your enemy seem so foolish to the world? Open discussion. Question number four. What obstacles stop you from blessing the one you hate?